The word blessed in the Bible is synonymous with the word for happy. To be blessed is to be happy. And Jesus gave a message called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, he said, if you want to be happy, if you want to be blessed, there are eight ways to receive your blessings. There are eight ways to be happy. And we know these eight ways as the B attitudes, and they're listed in Matthew 5. I love how the message translates the B attitudes. In Matthew 5, 1, it says, When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. And those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. And arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. And this is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God than his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God, peace, food, and drink, and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you will find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God on the outside world. And you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are in your place in God's family. And finally, you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution, because persecution drives you deeper into God. Today, we're going to begin a series on the Beatitudes. And we're going to dig deep into each of these spiritual truths that Jesus taught. And we're going to see how we're going to apply these states, because we're going to be a happy people. Amen? Amen. 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 People have been trying to find happiness ever since people have been in existence. And when you ask most people, what do they think will make their life meaningful? They'll say, a good job or a good relationship. But we all know that jobs and relationships have their ups and downs. Now, that's not to say there's not going to be moments of peace and joy and Delight with people and with your job, but the thing is there won't be sustained happiness that you'll find with work or people. Some people say if they had enough money, they'd always be happy. I want you to imagine that you just got a $10,000 a year raise. Mm. <laughs> now, I know that that's going to be exciting in the short term. Because it'll only be a matter of time before your expectations are going to change to fit your new budget. <laughs> and before you know it, after you've gotten your raise, you're going to be feeling pretty much the same way you did before your raise. Think back to the beginning of the year. Most of us got a tax return. And we were looking forward to it. We were imagining how we were going to spend that tax return. We could think of the bills paid off. We could think of the new this and the new that and the whatever this, and finally I could take care of this, and finally I could take care of that. All of us were feeling like, boy, when that money comes in, oh, boy. Tell me right now, in this very moment, right now, after you had gotten that money, that refund that you were so looking forward to, are you as happy now as you were the moment you opened up that check? No, you're not. Because money does not sustain you. Money does not sustain you. Anything we buy, new houses, new cars, new clothes, whatever, the joy of that moment will not sustain us. A purchase 
will not change your overall state of being. It'll be a light, momentary feeling. Uh, Robert Fulgham, he wrote this cute little poem. And he says in here, all I really need to know I learned in kindergarten. And it says, most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile at Sunday school. And these are the things I learned. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, and put things back where you found them. Clean up your mess, and don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody, and wash your hands before you eat. And most importantly, flush. <laughs> Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. And live a balanced life. Learn some, think some, draw and paint and sing and dance and play. And work every day. Take a nap every afternoon. And when you go out into the world, watch out for the traffic. Hold hands and stick together and be aware of wonder. There's so much truth in this poem. And there are wonderful illustrations of how we can improve the quality of our lives and how we relate to each other. But I'm going to ask you, are these wonderful truths the basic foundations that Jesus wants us to live by? Yeah. Now, they're certainly worthwhile, and they should be incorporated in our lives, but they're not quite the basic foundation that Jesus wants us to live by. He said in the first beatitude in Matthew 5, 3, he says, you're blessed, happy, when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rope. So the most basic foundation you can stand on to live as a blessed person is when you realize that you're at the end of your rope. And all you can do is depend on God. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite authors that I quote to you, I have every book in his, his, his uh, arsenal, is uh, Max Lucado. And he wrote about this guy who had been put in jail for committing murder. And this is what he wrote. While it's true that we all make mistakes, some mistakes are more public than others. How do you handle those mistakes that everybody knows about? Come close and listen. The answer lies in your relationship to Jesus. Because it's about forgiveness, about choices, understanding who you are in God's eyes. And then he goes on to talk about honorable. Honorable. He wore a tattooed anchor on his forearm. And it symbolized his personality, cast iron. He was muscular. The slightest movement of his arm bulged his biceps. His face was leathery. His glare could blister you. And today, his smile was forced. Unaball wasn't on the street where he was boss. He was in the jail where he was prisoner. He killed a man a neighborhood punk, and Unabal called him a restless teenager who sold marijuana to the kids on the street, and he made a nuisance of himself with his mouth. And one night, the drug dealer had used his mouth one too many times, and Unabal decided to silence it. He left the crowded bar where the two of them had been arguing. He went home, took a pistol out of a drawer, and walked back to the bar. He called Unable's name, and when that drug dealer turned around, he took a bullet in the heart. Unable was guilty, period. His only hope was that the judge would agree that he had done society a favor by getting rid of the neighborhood nuisance. He was going to be sentenced in a month. Max was a missionary in Brazil, and he said, I came to know Unable through a friend named Daniel, because Unable used to go to his gym and lift weights. Daniel had given Unable a Bible and visited him several times, and he asked Max to come and talk to him about
about Jesus. Max continues on, he says, our study centered on the cross, and we talked about guilt, and we talked about forgiveness, and the eyes of this murderer softened at the thought that the one who knows him best loves him the most. His heart was touched as we discussed heaven, a hope that no executioner could take from him. But as we began to discuss salvation, Unable's face began to harden. The head that had leaned towards me in interest now pulled back in caution. Unable didn't like the statement that the first step to coming to God is an admission of guilt. He was uneasy with words like, I've been wrong. I'm a sinner. It was my fault. I hurt you. I hurt God. Forgive me. Saying I'm sorry was out of character for him. He never backed down from any man. And he wasn't about to do it, even if it was God. And one final effort to pierce his pride, Max said, I asked him, don't you want to go to heaven? Sure, he said. Well, are you ready? Earlier, he might have cursed me. But now he had heard too many verses from the Bible, and he knew better. He stared at the floor for a long time, thinking about the question. And for a moment, I thought his stony heart was going to crack. And for a second, it appeared that Honorable, for the first time in his life, admit his failure, that he was wrong. But the eyes that lifted to meet me weren't tear-filled. They were angry. They weren't the eyes of a repentant prodigal. They were the eyes of an angry prisoner. All right. I'll become a New York Christian, but don't expect me to change my life. And his answer left my mouth bitter. And I said to him, you don't draw up the rules. It's not a contract that you negotiate before you sign. It's a gift, an undeserved gift. But to receive it, you have to admit that you need it. He ran his thick hair through his thick fingers through his hair and he stood up and he walked away from me and he said, don't expect to see me at church on Sundays. And I sighed, Max said. How many knocks in the head does a guy need before he'll ask for help? And I watched Unable pace back and forth in his cell and I realized the true prison was not made of bricks and mortar, but of his pride. He was twice in prison once because of murder and once because of stubbornness. The prison of pride. For most of us, it isn't as blatant as it was for him, but the characteristics are the same. The upper lip is just as stiff. The heart is just as hard. A prison of pride filled with self-made men and women determined to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, even if they land on their rear ends. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what they say. It only matters that they did it their way. You've seen the prisoners. The alcoholic that won't admit they have a drinking problem. The woman who refuses to talk to anyone about her fears and her insecurities. The person who rejects help when you can see that their lives are falling apart. <clears throat> perhaps to see such a prisoners, perhaps we need to look in the mirror. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Do you know what the biggest obstacle to salvation is? If. <laughs> If, if we confess our sins, and that's exactly what prisoners of pride refuse to do. They ain't never wrong. You know the excuses. Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm not Hitler either. <laughs> Me, a sinner? I just blow off steam sometimes, but I'm okay. I'm just as good as the next person. I pay my taxes. 
because I don't cheat. I tithe. But God's probably proud that I'm on his team. Justification, rationalization, comparison. These are the tools of the jailbird. They sound good. They sound familiar. But in the kingdom, they are hollow. The NIV says in Matthew 5.1, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who know they have nothing and nowhere to go but into the arms of God. If depending on God is an option, you're not really depending on him. And as long as Jesus is one of your many options, he is no option. As long as you can carry your burdens alone, you don't need a burden bearer. And as long as your situations bring you no grief, you don't need a comforter. And as long as you can take him or leave him, you might as well leave him because he's all or nothing. And he won't be taken half-hearted. We serve an all or nothing God. And you have to deal with that. All or nothing. You can't bargain with him. You can't negotiate with him. You can't say, Lord, I'll submit over here. But, you know, choice A and choice C, those places I, I don't want to go. God is not a multiple choice God. <laughs> Amen. He ain't dysfunctional. He loves us unconditional. But his blessings, they come with conditions. Not his love, but his blessings. What we have to do is we got to get blessable. God is not going to bless our wrong. He's not going to bless our failure. He's not going to bless our mistakes. He's not going to bless our pride, our arrogance, our insensitivity, our indifference. He is not going to bless any way we feel we want to live. But there are some things he will bless. Matthew 5, 1 says he will bless those who depend on him and nothing else. Dependence. It's defined as the state of relying on or needing someone or something for aid and support, to confide in, to trust. Several translations of Matthew 1. I love it when I was reading through. Listen at Matthew 5.1. The NIV says, God blesses those who realize they need him. In God's word, translation, it says, God blesses those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. In the common English, English version, it says, God blesses those who depend only on him. And in the New Century version, version, it says, God blesses those who have great spiritual needs. You see the pattern here? They're all saying, I am inadequate to live my life without God. Without God in my life, I am poor. Without God's help, I am inadequate. I can't meet all these demands. I can't withstand all these temptations. I can't lift myself above all these troubles without God. Amen. Psalm 146, 5 says, The Lord God blesses everyone who trusts Him and depends on Him. Folks, we got to trust Him. We got to depend on him. Our blessings won't come until we reach for him and nothing else. Not the men, not the woman, not the job, not the child, not the whatever. <laughs> whatever. whatever. Your blessings will not come until he is all you're reaching for. <laughs> to be poor in spirit. It's to be at the end of your rope. It's the first condition for getting blessed by God. It means you are completely dependent on Him. Without God, it ain't going to happen. 
So then the question goes, how do I do it? How do I depend or increase my dependence on God? Because we all have room to improve. <laughs> so this weekend, I want to give you five practical ways to increase your dependence on God, to increase your poverty of spirit so that there is more of God and less of you. And we're going to practice them. And the more we depend on these ways, the more we open up our heart and our lives for God's blessings. So let's start with the first thing we're going to practice. Again, we're increasing our dependence on God. Number one, I depend on God's wisdom, not mine. I depend on God's wisdom, not mine. To be blessed is to depend on God's wisdom. In other words, I listen to what God says, and I follow what he says, and I do what he says. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. You know, our, our, our ideas often lead to dead ends. Our thoughts will kill. Yes, they will. How many times have you said in your life, I wish so and so was? Do I have to fill in the blank? I wish they would just do a Star Trek thing. Just be, be beating them up. <laughs> beating them out of here. <laughs> Life would be so easy if. Our thoughts kill. Our thoughts are selfish and hurtful and fearful and anxious and prideful. And all of them lead to death. How many of us routinely lean on our own understanding? We think we know what's best. Not only for ourselves, but for everybody else, too. <laughs> you ever trusted in somebody else's opinion and it ended up blowing up in your face? Yes. Woo -hoo. I did. Me too. You ever trusted in your own feelings <laughs> and it ended up blowing up in your face? Yeah. I'm a witness. Mm -hmm. I've done it. Oh. We've all done it. We all have leaned on our own understanding to our hurt. When I was a young woman, I trusted someone with several hundred dollars because they said if I gave them this several hundred dollars in a couple of weeks, I'd make twelve thousand dollars. That's their number. Seriously? Really? Isn't that possible? All I had to do was bring in two other people and they donate oh, their several hundred dollars. Oh, 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 oh. And then those other people, it would surely happen, would get two other people and they would donate and then I would be pushed up to them. And then at the end, i get these $12,000 put in my hands. There's a name for that. It's so easy, so simple, so wise in the world. Lost every cent. At the time, I was not happy. But looking back, you know, sometimes the world got to spank you for you to realize the world ain't got nothing for you. For those of you who don't know, that was a Ponzi scheme. Amen. I lost every cent. Other people's wisdom hurt me. I trusted my own thinking about this brother way back when. He seemed like a good fit. He was cute. They're <laughs> <laughs> always cute. They're not always cute. It depends on your level. But and he was a Christian. Oh. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
And in those dark moments when you cannot see your way, you will need God's strength to get you through. People go through a divorce and they never recover. They go through a breakup and they never recover. They go through an illness and they never go recover. Whatever. Life will hit all of us. And why don't they recover? You know why people are miserable? It's because they're stuck. Miserable people are stuck. Think of a miserable person right now. Somebody you look at it and say, man, they are miserable. <laughs> what happened to them? They got stuck. Something hit them, something hurt them, like it does all of us. But they didn't move on. They did not move on. They got stuck. And you know how you get stuck? By depending on your own strength. I'll take care of this. I'll figure this out. I know what to do. Yeah, you know what you have to do to get yourself stuck. Only God can unstuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 71, 16 says, I walk in the strength of the Lord. So when I'm being drained, when something is trying to break me, when someone is trying to break me, Psalm 71, 16, I walk in the strength of the Lord. Let's all say that second affirmation yes. together. I, I walk, walk in the strength of the Lord. Which song is that? Psalm 7116. That's your second challenge. Some of you are running on empty. You're done. You're done. I don't have nothing more left. This is true. That's when you got to depend on God and say that second affirmation. I walk in the strength of the Lord. Now you're not just saying this just to say it. You're saying it to apply it. So you walk in the strength of the Lord. And then you wait for the infilling. You don't walk in the strength of the Lord when you're on empty. Everybody can stay. 